I, I have to admit that um, I didn't have a chance to get stage fright today. Somehow sitting in the traffic and having Luann Walker leap out of the car and <laughs> run past the line of cars in front of us and then wave us into the, into the other lane and Gordon and I looked at each other and Mikkel was with us too and we did it. We did it. And she had to, <laughs> Luann! She had a hat on in case the storm got her, and she leapt out of the car, and she, she got us here actually probably 17 minutes sooner than uh, we would have been. So I understand that uh, Meg is on the way. She'll be here eventually. Um, so I'll dedicate this reading to Luann. <laughs> who is also a wonderful friend and editor. And um, I thank Bob and Julie and Carla and everyone who's been involved in, in making this happening. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful conference. And um, I must have the best group of students ever. Uh, but I say that, I say that every year. But, <laughs> but that's what it feels like. So. Um, this afternoon, I was um, figuring out what to, what to read to you, and I, um, I decided to read to you from the beginning of my new book, because that's really book in progress. It's really a way to test it. <clears throat> and as I was thinking, okay, I want to bring this in, and I don't want to bring this in, I found myself cutting some things, and then wondering afterwards, do I really need them? <laughs> you know, which is what we've talked about in class, too. Um, it's winter, 1879, and the setting is, um, is a peninsula by the North Sea, the Nordsee in Germany, and it's called Nordstrand. Okay, now the lighting, let's see. Chapter one. He comes to her tonight along the ocean side of the dike, leaves the cot in the barn where he sleeps when the circus, circus winters over, and walks to his wife's bed that also used to be his. Here in the dark room beneath the pitched roof, color whispers to Lotta about their three older children away from the island. I need to do something to turn this off. Can I do that? Because it's, it's distracting me. Yes, we got it. Great, thank you, Carla. It says Bob's Riding Shack. <laughs> <laughs> All your guiding needs, man. I'm looking at this and I'm looking at this and this is what, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Bob's Riding Shack is distracting me in a major way. You did it. You did it. <laughs> Can it go totally dark? Yes. Thank you. I thought you were going to put your head on it when you walked in. Like that. <laughs> okay. Chapter one. He comes to her tonight along the ocean side of the dike leaves the cot in the barn where he sleeps when the circus winters over and walks to his wife's bed that also used to be his. Here, in the dark room beneath the pitched roof, color whispers to Lotte about their three older children away on the island. This is how it begins, again, between them. They're probably still asleep, he says, and feels Lotte waiting next to him next to him, silent and waiting. It's still early, he adds. Hannah Laura will wake the little ones, tickle them awake, you know how she is. Hannah Laura, his firstborn, raising her pointy chin when she asks him yet another question. 
No one else knows the children the way he and Lotte do. To draw her in, Carla says, soon they'll have breakfast. And already that idea lodges itself inside his heart. It could be true. Slices of boiled ham, Lotte's voice is raspy. Yes, he says, and Dutch cheese. Exotic fruits, she says. They'll eat pastries, he prompts her. Pastries, so light they'll pass their lips like, like breath, Lotta murmurs, no longer resisting, but losing herself with them on the island where it is always balmy, so different from the hazy Nordstrand Peninsula where they were born. On the island, they can dress their children like royalty, feed them like royalty. What kind of exotic food? Food, Kala asks. Oranges. Her throat swells with sudden wild joy for her children who can eat oranges every day. Lotta once tasted an orange, one slice of one orange when she was in third grade, and her teacher, Sister Sieglinde, carried oranges on the train from Italy, oranges blessed by the Pope, and pulled one apart into golden half moons that she laid on the tongues of her students like communion wafers. Delicacies you and I could never afford for them, Kalle says, and brings his toes beneath her feet curls and flexes them. Lotte strokes his shoulder. All the riches of all the world. She doesn't stop color when he brings his mouth to her breast, brings himself, and she's ready. First time since two summers ago. Is almost ready for him, except he's sucking so hard that she slips her thumb into the seal an instinctive motion she hasn't used since she loosened Belbel that way, thumbnail toward her nipple, the fleshy top of her thumb toward her daughter, then the gentle plop of letting go. The seal of her other baby's mouth was lighter, but Belbel would latch onto her lips, gum, tongue, teeth, and she's right back to nursing her daughter not now, not now, not, but it's her husband still at her breast. She brings her elbows forward and when he falls from her, she hinges her fingertips in the hollows of her clavicle, her forearms a gate of bones. How foolish to think we might find one another again in the sweet hidden where our children began. He's squeezing his eyes shut. Color? Eyes shut till he can see them again, his children. A string of small shapes fluttering from Lotta's hand, the only movement on the tidal flats, except he can't tell who is next to Lotta when the freak wave comes at them, who in the middle, who at the end of the string that spools and unspools like the strings of kites he built as a boy, Bits of cattail fluff nodded into their tails for balance. Transparent paper, the colors of church windows, stretched across strips of balsa wood. A kite would have risen, he moans. Lotte presses the back of her wrist against his left cheek. It used to ease him, bring him back to himself. It's how he must have slept in his mother's womb he once told Lotte, nestled on his left side, the back of his wrist into his cheek. But tonight this doesn't soothe him because he must ask Lotte why she brought both arms around the baby Wilhelm and let go of the older three when the wave overtook them. Isn't that why he had to come back? Because he's been afraid to know whose hand she let slip away. Hannelore's hands, Martin's hand, Belbel's hand. He can't breathe. What right does he have 
to ask after deserting her, taking nothing but his carving tools and one change of clothing when he joined the circus as it traveled north. I have some notes to myself at the end of the first chapter. Um, things I want to work in in the first and second chapter, and I thought I'd read them to you. Um, I want to weave in more of their surroundings, um, smells, sensuous details. Um, I want the sounds from the sea pressing against the house um, that Lotte's grandparents, or maybe her parents, uh, built against the dike. Um, houses like that, uh, they're dim downstairs uh, because you see the slope of the dike from the back windows. But upstairs, the light gets in and you have a view across the Nordsee. Um, I want to describe the shape of the door of the Kinderzimmer, children's home, where the youngest, Wilhelm, is, a, is asleep. Some of this, I tried to do this today as I was getting ready for this, but um, I need a lot more time. It'll, it'll take me days to do, to do this. Uh, but I thought I'd let you in on that process of knowing you still have to bring in material and you don't quite know where. And we've talked about that a lot in our workshop. When Color awakens, he can't remember falling asleep, but already he's sleeping again, dreaming of some animal scrambling across his legs. He stirs, feels the weight shift, the dream shift. In his sleep, Color loses children. He puts them aside for a moment, forgets them. Light then, and next to him Lotte, eyes still closed. Nestled against her is Wilhelm, scrawny knees tucked to his belly. Is the boy even old enough to climb across the railing of his crib? He's only two, two years and two months. But already Color sees the boy pull himself up the railing, make it across and down to the floor and onto the big bed by himself, burrow between his sleeping parents. Now, Lotte, she must have gotten up, walking barefoot across the cold floor to carry Wilhelm here. First, she wraps herself into the puckered robe she keeps on the hook by the door to the Kinderzimmer that Wilhelm used to share with his sisters and brother. Her robe big enough to envelop the boy and herself as she lifts him from his crib and brings him into this bed. Is that where the boy has been sleeping all those weeks and months I've been away? She should admit that she let Wilhelm have all of her, admit that's why she relinquished the others. All at once, color can't bear being near the boy, swinging both legs across the edge of the mattress. He stands but keeps his head low so he won't hit it against the ceiling that slants from the peak above his bed. The habit of memory, the habit of rising thousands of mornings with his wife and keeping his head low. He scoops last night's clothes from the bird shelves he built along the low walls. Such fine carpentry, his neighbor said. But fine carpentry is child's work for toy makers, school to carve the most infinite details. When he fastens his suspenders, the boy scuttles over to the empty side of the bed, sits against the pillow, so quiet, this one. The others always woke with some sound, giggling or crying or babbling before language became words. But Wilhelm stares at him without sound, eyes deep set in his pointy face. To think how plump he was before Lotte's breasts dried up, before she threw him into the sea, wailing at God to keep him in return for the other three. <clears throat> it, <clears throat> it was a hundred year wave, the old women of Nordstrand say. It was not that Lotte Janssen miscalculated the tides. If you're born on Nordstrand, you grow up respecting the rise and fall 
of the North Sea, knowing it the same way you know the patterns of your breath. Tourists might drown, but not locals. Tourists were foolish enough to walk out too far on the wet sand. If locals died by water, it was in a storm or when a fishing boat capsized. This hundred year wave has become part of the peninsula's lore, defining the landscape as much as the people who tell and retell the story, who consider themselves witnesses, not only those who saw Lotte Janssen and her children walk onto the tidal flats, but even those who heard about it later and yet speak of it as if they'd been next to Lotte that August Monday, just before all wind ceased abruptly and the sky faded from blue to yellow, blotting the sun. In these stories, memories, the old women will insist, memories. Lotte Janssen and her children follow the receding tide, dancing and playing while she carries the baby and the others hold on to one another and to her free hand. Free hand, some women will ask and rush to answer their own question. How free can any woman's hand be if she has children hanging from it? They claim they heard Lotte sing out, let's put our feet in the water because this is the sun's water. Who of them hasn't let the sun lick water at their ankles, their calves? You know what that's like. You also know what it's like to go under while playing in the sea as children or swimming out too far as adults. And you allot your own stories to Lotte Janssen as you describe how the wave slammed into her, filling her mouth and her nose and her eyes but you refuse to imagine having your children ripped from you. To each other, you wonder aloud why God pun punished Lotte and Carla Janssen without his mercy. Is it because they copulated before marriage? But if that's the cause, you'd all be going under with sin. <clears throat> I think I'm going to skip chapter three because otherwise this is going to get too long. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you what happened um, <clears throat> um, after the wave, um, which happened two summers ago. So this is about 18 months after that. Um, Lotte told Carla how that how that terrible bargain came to her, offering a Wilhelm to God in order to get her other three children back. And um, he realized he would have gladly offered up his last born for just two, even just one. Um, and it describes how they were on the tidal flat searching for the children. And the circus was in town at that time. So there was this strange, um, sort of a bizarre crowd, uh, people, people from the circus still in their costumes, and the nuns, and the priest, and the townspeople, and pregnant girls from the St. Margaret home for pregnant girls, all of them looking for the children. Um, <coughs> color leaves. Um, walks past his barn along the dike, and um, there's some uh, some background about him and Lotte, how he uh, how he courted her, the early years together. And it also talks um, about. Well, let me see. <clears throat> they married uh, when uh, Lotte turned uh, 16. Eventually, they had children and lost children, and he left her. Not right away, though. He did try to stay. They tried to find his way back to his wife and their grieving, while Wilhelm shrieked even when she managed to coax a dry nipple into his wide open mouth that kept shrieking when the priest and Sister Francisca arrived with one of the girls from the St. Margaret home for unwed girls. Some of them were still so young that they'd jump rope in the hallways, play hide and seek in the chapel. 
They delight in pranks, so the ends of sleeves shut, throw blackboard erasers at each other till puffs of chalk swirled in the air, settled on their dresses and the nuns' habits. But the nuns didn't scold the girls because they were glad for their ubermut exuberance. Chapter four, Tilly, her name was Tilly, 13 years old, breasts swollen hot with milk, her baby girl would never drink because the adoptive family had come for her as soon as she was born. One of the lucky babies, the nun said, already chosen before her birth because you have good posture and good sense. They tried to cool Tilly's breasts with cabbage leaves, brewed sage tea for her. The instant Tilly entered the toy maker's house, the screams of the baby made her breasts leak, like wetting herself only in the wrong place. Mortified, she covered the front of her blouse with both hands. Her palms were itching. While her pastor Bonauer and the toy maker stayed behind in the kitchen, Sister Francisca led Tilly into the bedroom where the mother lay propped up by pillows with a big screaming baby who was squirming away from her breast. She's gone dry, Sister Francisca whispered to Tilly and lifted the boy from his mother. Here she sat and gently positioned him against Tilly's left breast. Tilly stifled a sob of relief when he sucked right away and his shrieks dwindled to gulps at the fullness of this nipple that fit so perfectly into his mouth and unfurled his belly. Sister Francisca took out her rosary and knelt by the bed of the boy's mother. <clears throat> Hi, Meg. Its amber beads soaked the light from the window. As a child, Chilly, Tilly had played with chunks of amber she and her friends had collected along the edge of the North Sea, fascinated by the insects trapped in golden resin from pine trees. A beetle, a spider still in its web, so lifelike that any moment they might crawl again. <clears throat> Sister Francisca nudged her rosary into the hands of the mother who twisted her fingers into a knot that wouldn't let anything in. Tilly wanted to stop the nun, take the rosary away and hide it. Gently, the sister draped the amber beads around the mother's wrists. I'll pray with you, she said. Tilly tightened her hold on the boy who unleashed in her yearning to get her own child back but the nuns would say it was too late. She suddenly knew why they hadn't let her nurse, because of this, this odd fusion of a baby's lips with your nipple. And if you feel that fusion with another woman's child, just think how much stronger it would be with your own. Too late. Think of all the children who are never chosen. Wilhelm's pudgy hands padded at her swollen breasts that grew where her chest, just last year, had been as flat as her brother's when she wrestled him. Too late. Wilhelm filled her arms so differently than her daughter had, three times as heavy and much longer. How old is he, she whispered. His mother turned her face toward her, eyes like cracked glass. I'll steal the rosary, Tilly promised her silently. I will. Eight months, Sister Francisca said. Eight months. About 240 days. 120 times as old as my own baby. But only three times her weight. And with that, a foreknowledge as potent as memory that Wilhelm would be the last child to ever drink from her. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.
embarrassing because you've been waiting for Meg and everybody's late and everything, but uh, and I haven't prepared to do this, so I don't know what I'm going to do. Let's see. Uh, all right, I'll do something brave. I just wrote this song. Uh, I have to do a sort of a talk or a leading a, a talking thing. Can you hear this? About uh, Edith Wharton at... Uh, <laughs> Um, why is that funny? Uh-oh, having a hot flash. Okay. No, I had to do a talk on Edith Wharton, like I know anything about Edith Wharton, so I have been studying. I've, actually, the book is um, uh, House of Mirth, the House of Mirth, and I'm doing it on, uh, at Bryant Park. Why is everyone laughing? <laughs> because you know something I don't know. I've been studying this book, and I've been reading everything everyone has been saying about it, and basically, it's uh, mind-boggling. Ha has everyone read it? Yes. Has anyone not read it? Yes. Good, I'm glad, I'm glad, because I had not read it, and now I've read it twice. Anyway, I've read it and so much that has been said about it that I, I was at a yoga class the other day, and after the yoga class, I, I stood out in the lobby, and all of a sudden, I, I literally, a song about the book came to me. I had to like run home like as if I had diarrhea or something to write it down. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't even know if I uh, will remember it, but there's a couple of things. The, the uh, heroine in the book is called Lily, and she, um, that is, small little point, uh, the name that Edith Wharton's childhood friends used to call her was Lily. <clears throat> and then, uh, what else happened? Um, oh yeah, in, uh, in her first novel that she wrote, which never got published, at the end of the uh, novel, she included several reviews of her novel that she wrote that were not real. <laughs> so I thought that was interesting and that affected the song. And then the very last thing that you have to know is just that she does leave out, and I, I hope this isn't ruining, I don't think it is, uh, <laughs> the ending, but it is about the ending. She leave, There's a word at the very end of the book that she leaves out of the book, which I thought was, well, after everything I've been through, about the book. I thought it was fascinating. So <laughs> that's basically what you need to know. Now I hope I remember it. Okay. What would I what, what would I what would I be if I were the one word deep in a book hidden and unheard so sly of the writer so mercifully left out the one missing word in silence to shout the word of the lily not mangled or muttered will never be stolen never be uttered let the hundreds and thousands of other words say be chewed up and spit out and even misread. But she kept the mysterious thing to herself. When the pages are closed up and put on the shelf, she'll know all was not given, all not took. Cause she kept the final word on her own book. Are we to listen to what was not said? In quiet dreams run amok in our heads. 
solitude whispered the intimate word that could not be scribbled, only inferred. Long ago now was written a lily for us to expound upon willy-nilly. We can speculate, ruminate, and argue the word, but it's still it flies off free as a bird. She kept the mysterious thing to herself. When the pages are closed up and back on the shelf, she knows all was not given, all not took, cause she kept the final word on her own book. That was so great. When do they ever have an entract between things here? Do they have they had that before? I don't think so. I think not. Well, you all deserve it, having to have waited so long. And um, uh, I'm going to read from something that I've never read aloud from before, because I just finished it this week. And it's my new novel. And Suzzy's read it, actually. And it's called The Interestings. And I was thinking, you know the way trucks sometimes have signs on the back that say, how's my driving, and then there's a phone number. I feel like maybe writers, when they read new work, should have a sign that says, how's my writing, with the phone number of the publisher. <laughs> so um, I realized that this book, now seriously, was inspired somewhat by, have any of you seen uh, the Michael Apted 28 Up, 7 Up movies? Uh, which I just love, and he follows a group of children and films them every seven years, um, and he's still doing it. And the characters in The Interestings meet in childhood in 1974 at a, uh, a summer camp for artistically gifted teenagers, and the book follows them over 35 years. Uh, and what I really was trying to do was sort of look at what happens to early talent over time. And this is a really compressed version of the first chapter when the characters are really, really young and it's before life comes in and, you know, ruins everything. Um, so I'm really sorry, Ursula, that I, where are you, Ursula, that I missed most of that and I'm hoping you'll perhaps give me a private reading later. Thank you. I, I love your work, so. And thank you again to the conference for having me back. And I like to keep you waiting. <laughs> On a warm night in early July of that long evaporated year, the interestings gathered for the very first time. They were only 15, 16, and they began to call themselves the name with tentative irony. Julie Jacobson, an outsider and possibly even a freak, had been invited in for obscure reasons, and now she sat in a corner on the unswept floor and attempted to position herself so she would appear unobtrusive and yet not pathetic. The teepee, designed ingeniously though built cheaply, was airless on nights like this one when there was no wind to push in through the screens. It had been miraculous when Ash Wolf had nodded to her earlier in the night at the row of sinks and asked if she wanted to come join her and some of the others later. Some of the others, even that wording, was thrilling. Julie had looked at her with a dumb, dripping face. Sure, she'd said, out of instinct. What if she'd said no? She liked to wonder afterward in a kind of strangely pleasurable, baroque horror. What if she'd turned down the lightly flung invitation and went about her life, thudding obliviously along like a drunk person, a blind person, a moron, someone who thinks that the small packet of happiness that she carries is enough? Yet having said sure at the sinks in the girls' bathroom, here she was now, planted in the corner of this unfamiliar, ironic world. Irony was new to her and tasted oddly good, like a previously unavailable summer fruit. 
Soon, she and the rest of them would be ironic much of the time, unable to answer an innocent question without giving their words a snide little adjustment. Fairly soon after that, the snideness would soften, the irony would be well mixed with seriousness, and the years would shorten and fly. Then it wouldn't be long before they all found themselves shocked and sad to be fully grown into their thicker, finalized adult selves with almost no chance for reinvention. That night, though, long before the shock and the sadness and the permanence, as they sat in the wooden boy's teepee for the first time, Ash Wolf said, we should call ourselves something. Why, said Goodman, her brother, so the world can know just how unbelievably interesting we are? We should be called the unbelievably interesting ones, said Ethan Figman. How's that? The interesting, said Ash. That works. So it was decided, from this day forward, because we are clearly the most interesting people who ever fucking lived, said Ethan, let us be known as the interestings, and let everyone who meets us fall down dead in our path from just how fucking interesting we are. <laughs> in a ludicrously ceremonial moment, they lifted paper cups and joints. The name was ironic, and the improvisational christening was jokily pretentious, but still, Julie Jacobson thought, they were interesting. These teenagers around her, all of them from New York City, were like royalty and French movie stars with a touch of something papal. <laughs> she had never met anyone like them. They were interesting compared not only with the residents of Heckville, New York, the suburb where she'd lived since birth, but also compared with what was generally out there, which at the moment seemed baggy-suited, nefarious, thoroughly repulsive. Briefly, in that summer of 1974, when she or any of them looked up from their one-act plays and animation cells and dance sequences and acoustic guitars, they found themselves staring into a horrible doorway, and so they quickly turned away. Two boys had copies of all the president's men on the shelves above their beds. The book had come out only a couple of weeks before camp began, and at night, when the teepee talk wound down into sleep or rhythmic, crickety masturbation, they would read by flashlight. Can you believe those fuckers, they thought? This was the world they were meant to enter, a world of fuckers. <laughs> Julie Jacobson and the others paused before the doorway to that world, and what were they supposed to do, just walk through it? By the end of the summer, Nixon would lurch away, leaving his damp slug trail, and the entire camp would watch on an old Panasonic that had been trundled into the dining hall by the camp owners, Manny and Edie Wonderlick, two aging socialists who were legendary in the tiny, diminishing world of aging socialists. <laughs> now they were gathering because the world was unbearable and they themselves were not. Ethan Figman, thick-bodied, unusually ugly, sat with his mouth slack and a record album in his lap. He was one of the first people she'd noticed after her mother and sister drove her up here days earlier. He'd been wearing a floppy denim hat then, and he greeted everyone around him on the lawn. That boy looks ridiculous, Julie's sister Ellen said quietly as they stood nearby, fresh out of their green Dodge Omni and the four-hour drive. He did look ridiculous, but Julie already felt the need to be protective of this boy she didn't know. No, he doesn't, she said. He looks fine. The sisters were only 16 months apart, but Ellen was close-faced and held surprisingly condemnatory opinions, which had often been dispersed in the small ranch house where they lived with their mother and, until that winter, their father. In January, Warren Jacobson was dead, which was a grinding torment and also a relief. Summer lurked, still unfilled. At the last minute, Julie's English teacher suggested this camp, which had an open slot and agreed to take her on scholarship. Tonight, in Boys TP3, Ethan Figman seemed as confident as he'd been on the lawn that first day. Confident, but probably also conscious of his own ugliness, which would never go away over the whole of his life. On the surface of the record album, he began rolling joints with efficiency. Figman, increased the velocity, the natives are restless, said Jonah Bay. Julie knew almost nothing yet, but she did know that Jonah, a good-looking boy with blue-black hair that fell to his shoulders, was the son of the folk singer, Susanna Bay. Across from Ethan, Jonah sat with his steel-string guitar, wedged between Julie and Kathy Kiplinger, a girl who danced feverishly all day in the dance studio. Kathy was big and blonde and far more womanly than most girls could be comfortable with at age 15. Sometimes the outline of her nipples would appear through the fabric of a leotard, like buttons on a sofa cushion. 
and they would need to be ignored by everyone the way nipples often needed to be ignored in their vicissitudes. <laughs> but up above them all on a top bunk sprawled Goodman Wolf, six feet tall, sun-sensitive, big need, and hyper-masculine in khaki shorts and buffalo sandals. If this group had a leader, he was it. The previous summer, in the middle of waiting for Godot, Goodman had climbed into the lighting booth and plunged the stage into darkness for a full three minutes just to see what would happen. <laughs> Sitting in the dark, more than one girl secretly imagined Goodman lying on top of her. He would be so big, like a lumberjack trying to fuck a girl. No, more like a tree trying to fuck a girl. The wolf siblings had been coming to Spirit in the Woods since they were 12 and 13. They were central to this place. Goodman was big and blunt and exciting and unsettling. His sister Ash was waifish, open-hearted, a beauty. Tonight, the screen door had winced shut behind the departing, shooed away boys who lived here, and then the three girls from the other side of the pines had arrived. There were six people all together in this single bulb-lit, conical wooden structure. They would meet again whenever they could over the rest of the summer and frequently in the city over the next year and a half. After that, over the following 30 odd years, only some of them would meet and finally no one could be sure which of them were all that interesting anymore. Julie Jacobson at the start of that first night had not yet transformed into the far better sounding Jules Jacobson. As Julie, she'd always felt all wrong. She was gangling, her skin went pink and patchy at the least provocation. Over the year in which her father was dying, she had occupied herself by zealously splitting her split ends, and her hair had become frizzled and wild. Sometimes she discovered a single hair with an uncountable number of splits, and she would tug on the whole thing, listening to the crackle as the hair broke between her fingers like a branch, and she experienced a sensation that resembled a private sigh. A haircut and a perm might help, her mother said. After the perm, when Julie saw herself in the salon mirror, she ran out into the parking lot, her mother chasing after her, saying it would die down, it wouldn't be so big tomorrow. <laughs> oh, honey, it won't be so dandelion-y, her mother called from across the blinding row of cars. Now, among these people who had been coming to this teenage performing arts and visual arts summer camp in Belknap, Massachusetts, for two or three years, Julie, a dandelion-y, poodly outsider, was surprisingly compelling to them. Just by being here in this teepee at the designated hour, they all seduced one another with greatness or with the assumption of eventual greatness, greatness in waiting. During that first hour, books were discussed, mostly ones written by spiky and disaffected European writers. Gunter Grass is basically God, said Goodman Wolf, and the two other boys agreed. Julie had never actually heard of Gunter Grass, but she wasn't going to let on. If anyone asked, she would insist that she too loved Gunter Grass, although she would add as protection, I haven't read as much of him as I would like. <laughs> I think Anias Nin is God, Ash Wolf said. How can you say that, said her brother Goodman. She's the worst. Anias Nin and Gunter Grass both have umlauts, remarked Ethan. <laughs> Maybe that's the key to their success. I'm going to get one. <laughs> As Julie felt the effects of Ethan Figman's wet-ended joint, she imagined all their saliva joining on a cellular level, and she thought, I get it. We are all nothing more than a seething, collapsing ball of cells. Ethan, she saw, was looking at her intently. Maybe you want to slow down a little over there, he said. I'm keeping an eye on you. Ethan turned back to the others, but in her precarious state, she felt that Ethan had made himself her protector. She kept thinking a high person's thoughts, focusing on the collage of human cells that filled this teepee. They were all just countless cells that had joined together to make this group in particular, this group that Julie Jacobson suddenly decided she was in love with, that she would stay in love with for the rest of her life. Goodman suddenly said, Figman, there's something I've always wanted to ask you. How do you get through life with that name? Doesn't it depress you? Ethan said, I'd like to say for the record that Ethan Figman is not such a terrible name. Goodman Wolf is much worse. It's like a name for a Puritan. Goodman Humility Wolf, thy presence is requested in the silo. Julie, in her stoned state, had the idea that all the conversation tonight was banter, or the closest they could get to banter at their age. The level of actual wit here was low, but the apparatus of wit had been activated, readying itself for later. There's a girl in our cousin's school in Pennsylvania, Ash said, named Crema Siemens. 
You made that up, Kathy Kiplinger said. <laughs> no, no, she didn't, Goodman said. It's the truth. We both know her. Ash and Goodman looked suddenly earnest and serious. If they were performing a synchronized sibling mind game, they had worked out a convincing routine. Crema Siemens, Ethan repeated thoughtfully. It's like a soup made from various Siemens. A medley of Siemens. It's a flavor of Campbell's soup that got discontinued immediately. <laughs> Now, let us all observe a moment of silence for Crema Siemens, Julie heard herself say. She hadn't planned to say a word tonight, and as soon as she spoke, she felt she'd made a mistake. <laughs> Jacobson speaks, said Goodman Wolf. Jacobson. She was excited to hear this beautiful boy call her that, though it was hardly what she'd imagined a boy would ever call her. Goodman looked at her and smiled, and she had to prevent herself from standing up and reaching out to touch the planes of his golden face. Julie didn't even know what it was she was doing as she lifted her cup again. Oh, Crema Siemens, wherever thou art, she said loudly, your life will be tragic. It will be cut short by an accident involving animal deseminizing equipment. <laughs> this was a suggestive, nonsensical remark, but there were approval sounds from around the teepee. See, I knew there was a reason I invited her in, said Ash, turning to the others. Desemonizing. Go, Jules. Jules. There it was, right there. The effortless shift that made all the difference. She was Jules now. She would be Jules forever. Jonah Bay pulled at the strings of his mother's old guitar. Susanna Bay had taught acoustic guitar at this camp before her son was born. Every summer since then, even after she became very famous, she appeared at some point for an impromptu concert. Now Jonah began a few prefatory strums. When it seemed as if he might break into his mother's most well-known song, The Wind Will Carry Us, he instead played Amazing Grace in honor of that girl from Goodman and Ash Wolf's cousin's school who either did or did not exist. They had only a little more than an hour together, and then one of the counselors on patrol, a blunt-haired weaving instructor and lifeguard from Iceland named Gudrun Sigurd's daughter, came into the teepee with a bulky flashlight that looked as if it were meant to be used during night ice fishing. <laughs> she peered around and said, all right, my young friends, I can tell that you've been smoking pot that is not cool, though you may think it is. <laughs> well, said Goodman, now that you've made us see the error of our ways, it'll never happen again. <laughs> That is all well and good, but also you're consorting with mixed sexes, she said. We aren't consorting, said Kathy Kiplinger. We're having a kind of meeting. We formed a group, and it's going to last until we're dead. Well, said Gudrun, that is nice, but I do not want to see you sent home. Please break this up now, and all you girls, please go back through the pines. So the three girls left, heading away from the teepee in a slow, easy herd with their flashlights leading. Jules, walking down the path, heard someone call her new name. She turned and saw Ethan Figman, who came closer. The other girls kept walking ahead without her. Are you a little less high now, he said. Yes, thanks. There ought to be a control, he said, a knob on the side of your head that you could turn. <laughs> Can I show you something, he asked. She let herself be led down the hill toward the animation shed. Ethan Figman opened the unlocked door. Inside, the shed smelled plasticky, slightly scorched, and he threw on the fluorescent lights. Ethan threaded a projector, then shut off the lights. See, he said, what I'm about to show you are the contents of the right side of my brain. The left side is apparently just dead tissue. A cartoon sprang up on a sheeted wall. Figland read the credits, and antic characters began to prance and splat and jabber, speaking in voices that all sounded a little bit like Ethan. The characters in Figland were alternately wormy, phallic, leering, and adorable, while in the excess light from the projector, Ethan himself was touchingly ugly, with a raw sheath of arm skin etched with its own ugly dermatological cartoon. On Figland, characters rode trolleys, played the accordion, and a few of them broke into the Figman Gate Hotel. There was even a Figland version of Spirit in the Woods. Jules watched as characters built a bonfire, then paired off to have sex. She was mortified by their humpy, jerking movements, and the sweat that flew in their air around them meant to signify exertion. But her mortification was immediately painted over by awe. No wonder Ethan was beloved here at this camp. He was a genius. The cartoon came to an end, and the film flip-flapped on its reel. God, Ethan, she said, it's totally original. I love it. This was an important moment for him, but she didn't even understand why. 
I'm so glad, Ethan said. He stood before her, smiling, and she smiled too. What do you know, he said in a softer, husky voice. You love it. Jules Jacobson loves it. Just as she was enjoying hearing the strange name said aloud, Ethan thrust his big head toward hers, bringing his bulky body forward too, pressing himself upon her as if to line up all their parts. His mouth attached itself to hers. She'd already been aware that he smelled of pot, but up against her he smelled much worse, mushroomy, feverish, overripe. She yanked her head back and said, wait, what? He had probably reasoned that they were at the same level. He was popular here, but still a little bit gross. She was unknown and frizzy-headed and plain. They could unite. Though she'd gotten her head free, his body was still pressed against her, and that was when she felt the lump of him. A lump of coal, she could say to the other girls in her teepee, eliciting laughs. It's like, what's that poem in school, my last duchess, she could tell them, because at least this would demonstrate some knowledge of something. This was my first penis. Jules backed up several inches from Ethan, so no part of her was in contact with any part of him. I'm really sorry, she said. Oh, forget it, Ethan said hoarsely. You have nothing to feel sorry about. I think I'll find a way to live, a way to get along in the world, even though you didn't want to make out with me, Jules. For a second, she thought he was going to turn away furiously and leave her. But, a soft, but in a soft voice, Ethan said, I don't want to be a schmuck about this. I mean, people have been rejected by other people since the dawn of time. I've never rejected anyone in my life, Jules said fiercely, although, she added, I've never accepted anyone either. <laughs> oh, he said. He stayed by her side as they left the animation shed and trudged back up the hill together. When they reached the top, Ethan said, you say you haven't rejected or accepted anyone. You are 100% inexperienced, so maybe you're just nervous now. Your nervousness could be masking your real feelings. You think so, she asked, doubtful. Could be, he said, so I have a proposition for you. Reconsider, spend more time with me and let's see what happens. It was a reasonable request. She could spend more time with Ethan Figman experimenting with the idea of being part of a couple. All right, she told him she would reconsider. Only when he dropped her off at her own teepee did he leave her. Jules went inside and stood getting ready for bed. Across the teepee, Ash Wolf was encased in her sleeping bag that was red flannel lined with a repeating pattern of cowboys swinging lariats. So where were you, Ash asked. Oh, Ethan Figman wanted to show me one of his cartoons and then we started talking and it just got, it, it's hard to explain. Ash said, that sounds mysterious. No, it was nothing, said Jules. I mean, it was something, but it was strange. I know what they're like, Ash said. What, what are like? Those moments of strangeness, life is full of them. What do you mean? Well, said Ash, and she got out of her own bed and came to sit beside Jules. I've always sort of felt that you prepare yourself over the course of your whole life for these big moments, but when they happen, you sometimes feel totally unready for them, or even that they're not what you thought, and that's what makes them strange. That's true, Jules said. That's just what happened to me. A first kiss, she had thought, was supposed to magnetize you to the other person. The magnet and the metal were meant to fuse and melt on contact into a sizzling brew of silver and red. But this kiss had done nothing like that. Jules would have liked to tell Ash all about it now. But the newly forming friendship was held back for a while longer by the presence of Kathy Kiplinger, who moved into the center of the girl's teepee, taking off her big, complicated bra and unharnessing her duo of woman-sized breasts distracting Jules with the thought that these spheres inside this conical building were the equivalent of a square peg in a round hole. <laughs> Jules wished Kathy weren't here at all and that Jane Zell wasn't here or somber-faced Nancy Mangiari, who sometimes played the cello as if she were performing at the funeral of a child. <laughs> if it were just Jules and Ash, she would have told her everything now. But the other girls were circling, and now Kathy Kiplinger, dressed only in a long pink t-shirt, was passing around a huckleberry crumble purchased at the good bakery in town that afternoon, and a warped fork from the dining hall. Someone said, God, it tastes like sex, and everyone laughed, including Jules, who wondered if sex, when it was really good, actually offered the pleasures of a huckleberry crumble, all goo and give. The subject of Ethan Figman was now lost for the night. 
The crumble went around a few times and everyone's lips became tribally blue and then the girls lay down in their separate beds and Jane Zell told them about her identical twin sister who had a shocking neurological disorder that sometimes caused her to slap herself in the face over and over. She'll be sitting there just totally calm, said Jane, and she suddenly starts to smack herself. Wherever we go, she makes a scene. It's horrible, but I'm used to it by now. You get used to whatever you get, Kathy said. Like, I'm a dancer, but I have these enormous breasts. It's like carrying around sacks of mail, but what am I supposed to do? I still want to dance. And you should try to do whatever you want, Jules said. We should all try to do whatever we want in life, she added, with sudden and perverse conviction. Nancy, why don't you take out your cello and play us something, Ash said, something with atmosphere, mood music. Even though it was very late, Nancy got her cello and sat on the edge of the bed, intently playing the first movement of a cello suite by Benjamin Britten, though Jules would not know what it was until many years later, driving somewhere in a car with her husband when it came on the classical radio station and the announcer identified it, and Jules said, oh. Now, as Nancy, as Kathy stood on someone's camp, sorry, now as Kathy Kiplinger stood on someone's camp trunk, her head perilously near the slant of the ceiling, and she began to perform a slow, freeform routine like a go-go dancer in a cage, she said, this is what guys like. This is what they want. They want to see you move. They want your breasts to swing a little as if you could hit them in the head and knock them unconscious. <laughs> We are the modern music and porno teepee, Nancy Mangiari cried with glee. All the girls felt fired up, overstimulated. The stark music and the laughter drifting from the teepee and scribbling among the trees, headed toward the boys in their own teepee, a message in the darkness before lockdown. Jules thought of how she was nothing like Ethan Figman, but she was nothing like Ash Wolf either. She existed somewhere on the axis between them, slightly disgusting, slightly desirable, not yet claimed by one side or the other. It was right not to agree to go over to Ethan's side just because he had wanted her to. As he had said, she had nothing to feel sorry about. Over the following few weeks of the eight-week season, Jules and Ethan spent a great deal of time together. When she wasn't with Ash, she was with him. Once, sitting with him by the swimming pool at dusk, she told him about her father's death. Wow, he was 42, Ethan said. Jesus, Jules, that's so young. And it's just so sad that you'll never see him again. He was your dad. He probably used to sing you little songs, am I right? No, said Jules. She let her fingers drape through the cold water. But then suddenly she remembered that her father had sung her one song once. Yes, yes, she said, a folk song. Which one? She began to sing in an unsteady voice. Just a little rain falling all around. The grass lifts its head to the heavenly sound. Just a little rain, just a little rain. What have they done to the rain? She stopped abruptly. Go on, Ethan said, and so embarrassed she continued. Just a little boy standing in the rain, the gentle rain that falls for years, and the grass is gone, the boy disappears, and rain keeps falling like helpless tears, and what have they done to the rain? When she was finished, Ethan just kept looking. That killed me, he said. You know what that song's about, right? Acid rain, she said. He shook his head. No, nuclear testing. See, back when it was written, the government had been doing all this above-ground nuclear testing, which put strontium-90 into the air. And the rain washed it down into the ground, and it got into the grass, where all the cows ate it, and then gave milk, which little children drank, little radioactive children. So President Kennedy signed a bill against above-ground nuclear testing. Your dad was political, he said? No, no, he wasn't political, said Jules. But she thought of how she hadn't known her father all that well. She'd almost never asked him anything about himself. How could that be? He'd been thin, fair-haired, burdened, and now he was dead at 42. So then she and Ethan were crying together, which led to inevitable kissing, which wasn't nearly as bad this time because they both tasted identically of mucus. <laughs> it didn't even matter to Jules that she didn't feel excited. Instead, she felt mostly desperate. As the days passed, Ethan intuited that this was the exact kind of foreplay Jules Jacobson required. One night, the entire camp was instructed to gather on the lawn. No other information was given. I bet the Wonderlicks are going to announce that there's been an outbreak of syphilis, someone said. Maybe Nixon resigned, someone said. Or maybe he's dead, said someone else. If anyone deserves to be dead, it's Richard Nixon. 
Ethan and Jules sat together on a blanket on the hill and waited. He leaned his head against her shoulder, waiting to see what she would do. At first, she did nothing. Then he moved his head down into her lap, settling himself in and looking up at the darkening sky and the jumpy Japanese lanterns strung on wires between trees. Manny Wonderlick appeared before everyone and said, hello everyone, hello. I'd like to introduce a very special surprise guest. Jules craned to see a woman in a sunset-colored poncho carrying a guitar by her neck, picking her way across the grass to take her place on a platform. It was Jonah's famous folk singer mother, Susanna Bay. In person, she was beautiful in the way of very few mothers, her hair long and black and straight. Good evening, spirit in the woods, said the folk singer into the microphone when everyone was quiet. Are you having a wonderful summer? A series of affirmative calls rose up. Then she strummed her heart on her guitar and began to sing, The Wind Will Carry Us. After the performance, which was full of feeling and well-received, everyone stood around and ladled up pink punch from a big metal bowl. Tiny fruit flies twittered on the surface of the punch, but mostly no one could see the rest of the bugs in the descending dark. The number of them ingested that summer was formidable. Bugs in punch bowls, in salads, even scarfed down on the inhale in open mouth sleep at night. Ethan sipped his punch like it was brandy from a snifter, and when he was done, he tossed his paper cup into the bin and dropped his arm lightly upon Jules's shoulder. The way Susanna sings, the wind will carry us, is so sad, he murmured. Yeah, it really is, she said. It makes me think of the way people devote their lives to each other, Ethan said, and then one of them just leaves or even dies. He was somber, watching her, seeing if the melancholy mood could make her respond to him again. He wrapped his arms around her, and she willed herself to want this boy, for he was brilliant and funny, and he would always be kind to her, and he would always be ardent. But all she could feel was that he was her wonderful and gifted friend. I can't keep trying, she said, all in a flood, unplanned. It's not what I want to do. You don't know what you want, said Ethan, a little frantic. You're confused, Jules. You've had a major loss this year. You're still feeling it in strangers, in stages. You're feeling it in stages, you know, like Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and all that. Hey, he added, she's got an umlaut, too. <laughs> what? This isn't about my father, okay? Jules said, it isn't. Galloping into the lantern light at that moment came Goodman Wolf, along with a pouting ceramicist from Girls TP4 who always had clay under her fingernails. They stopped on the edge of the circle and the girl tipped her head up toward his and Goodman Wolf leaned down and then they kissed. Jules watched as Goodman's mouth pulled away with what she could swear she saw even from a distance, a smear of the girl's colorless lip gloss on his lips, like butter, like a prize. Jules imagined debasing herself with Goodman in some crude, figland-type way. She pictured cartoon drops of sweat flying out from their joined and magically naked selves. Thinking about this, she was suffused with a blast of sensation like the light from Ethan's projector. Feelings could come over you in a sudden, wild sweep. This was something she was learning at Spirit in the Woods. She could never, ever love Ethan Figman. It would have been exciting to love Goodman Wolf, of course, but that wasn't going to happen either, never. That kind of wild and beautiful boy could not love a plain girl. It wasn't possible. There would be no pairing off of any kind this summer, no passionate subsets formed. And though in some ways this was sad, in other ways it was a relief, for now they could all return to the boys' teepee, the six of them, and take their places in that perfect, unbroken, lifelong circle. The whole teepee would quake in preparation for liftoff, as though their kind of irony and their kind of conversation was so strong it could actually make a small wooden building rise up and hover briefly above the earth. Thank you. start? Do we want to take a few minutes for a Q&A? Do we want to just head out to the lobby? Raise your hand for Q&A. <laughs> Raise your hand for lobby. Seems like lobby is winning here. Yay, one last. Yay. Yay.